What has made mankind is an insatiable curiosity. Insatiable. What is that? Nobody knows. The phenomenon. Nobody's ever done this as far as I know. It's a huge amount of work, a huge amount of data and equipment. That has never been done. Whatever this is, is more complex than we could ever imagine. This is a first in the field of ufology. The variety of devices we're bringing as a team to study the phenomenon covered an entire spectrum of different technologies in real time. That moment shook me to the core because I knew my life was about to change again. I think we're going to have like a couple of really, really good spots. When I hear that you've assembled a team of top scientists using state-of-the-art equipment, I say to myself, it's about time. This is an unidentified, unclassified new phenomenon. Wow, Tic Tacs. Basic. Maybe Tic Tac. Maybe. Caught on our cameras. Yep. That's incredible. Crazy. It isn't crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. We can go from body heat to very cold, like about minus 62 Celsius or minus 80 Fahrenheit. Wow. We will be transmitting data up to 800 terahertz in frequency. Our highest technology is up around 500 gigahertz. I can't tell you how much I'm looking forward to seeing what you've uncovered. We're triangulating and converging at two points, the same, same object. It's, it's, gone. it's gone, it's gone, gone. it's friggin' gone. That's up over Catalina. We could be heading towards the biggest see I told you so in history. That's what we need, the smoking gun that'll clinch it, that once and for all will settle the debate. No ifs, ands, or buts. And in the process, rewrite all of human history. Oh my god, you guys, is this the wormhole? It's insane. Caroline Corey, an award-winning filmmaker, author of best-selling books on consciousness science and energy medicine. As a child and throughout her life, Caroline has had numerous UFO encounters as well as ESP and precognition experiences, which led her to become deeply connected to do various existential topics, the study of consciousness, the mechanics of the universe. Her latest film is called A Tear in the Sky. Caroline, welcome back. How are you? Hi, George. I'm great. How are you doing? Everything is good. We're going to talk a lot about your documentary. When did you do this? You just finished it this year, didn't you? Yeah, I just came out a couple of months ago, and I'm very, very excited about it uh, because uh, it has a lot of new stuff. Tell me about the title, A Tear in the Sky. Yeah, so, you know, I had the idea to do a movie on... Um, UFOs a couple of years ago. And to me, it's not just about UFOs. I'm interested in how did they get here? <laughs> how is it possible that they show up, they zigzag in the sky and disappear? So I'm more interested in that aspect of the phenomenon. And so for me, I think it's related to uh, maybe wormholes or openings or some uh, some sort of entry exit points, if you will, in the fabric of space time, uh, because you see them and then you don't. So that's the reason why I I wanted to call the movie a tear, like an opening in the sky. And um, you know that was two years ago, and uh, I think it was prophetic because we ended up. I don't want to talk too much about it yet, <laughs> but we ended up finding uh, something like a tear in the sky, which is pretty crazy. Interesting. I had a physicist on before you came on, Caroline, and we were talking about life in the outer space, and uh, he believes that it's very possible. He doesn't believe we've been visited yet because he's not sure about the propulsion systems, but you just talked about a couple things that are very possible and conceivable. 
Yeah, absolutely. In fact, uh, you know, we we know that Einstein was talking. We know about the Einstein-Rosen bridge, which allows, you know, two po- within the fabric of space-time, um, two points to collapse to create a sort of a wormhole so that you can um, basically go faster than the speed of light. I think that if you are an advanced civilization, you are using a propulsion system that works along those lines. You're not going to travel, you know, thousands of light years using our propulsion system, you know. So um, I think that's how extraterrestrials would be visiting us. Uh, I'm very convinced of that. And that's the reason why they behave the way they do in the sky, you know. So I think uh, that's exactly what's going on. Now, your investigation is scientific, but explain how you did that. Yeah, so when I had the idea of making a UFO film, I didn't want to just rehash kind of the same topics that the government has data, they're not releasing, you know, we know it is a problem. We know that already. I wanted to try to see how do we validate this topic um, in a way that would be irrefutable, you know? And so I thought we really need to do a scientific investigation. And as a filmmaker, uh, you research the subject. Okay, did anybody do something like this? You know, just to have the kind of a point of reference. Or, And I was shocked. I really did not find any coverage, any film, any group that had done an extensive uh, scientific ex- expedition. So that's why I was even more convinced, okay, it's time, um, let's do that, but how do we go about it? And so I started researching anybody, <laughs> any scientist who was looking into it, and I stumbled first on Kevin Day. And um, I'm sure most people by now may know who Kevin Day is. He was the radar operator on the Navy ship, the USS Nimitz, uh, in 2004. Mm -hmm. He was the first one who captured those famous Navy Tic Tac videos. Um, And so so I stumbled on him, and uh, he told me the story. And he told me that he was already working with a couple of scientists, and he was dream. It was his dream to uh, to do a, a, a scientific expedition, and so that's why we ended up. It was perfect uh, kind of connection, and we teamed up, um, and we started discussing how would we go about it to make it scientific. And so, um, you know, we had meetings after meeting, of course, you know, and um, and so we realized what is missing is uh, the type of equipment, because the problem with UFOs we see on YouTube, people have great footage, but it's usually one camera, one angle, maybe two. There's a few witnesses, but you don't have correlations across multiple devices. You know, you know, you have one type of CCD camera or maybe a night vision. And so we said that's one of the problems we need to resolve. So we had multiple cameras, multiple night vision, multiple FLIR cameras, which range, uh, which, ha- which reach in the uh, very high infrared range, uh, I mean, military grade. And so we had, we had radiation detectors, we had magnetometers, we had... You came spectrum. prepared, didn't you? Absolutely. We had hundreds of thousands of dollars of equipment all working at the same time. So that was one aspect that made the expedition very different, very special. Also, another thing scientifically, in order to um, get more data on the UFO... You have to capture it, hopefully, from multiple angles. Because then you're triangulating. You're getting, then you you have, um, you can um, get data on the speed or, you know, all sorts of uh, types of information and data that normally you wouldn't get. So we were positioned in three different locations to try to, triangulate and capture an object from multiple angles. That's another thing we did. And uh, we were there for uh, nonstop, five days, five days, five nights. That's intense. Yeah, exactly. 
And so, so that we thought, you know, we are going at it in a totally new way. It has never been done before. Uh, but, you know, think about it, George. I mean, five days. How many people do you know who go on, you know, UFO hunts for days and days and they don't see anything? So even with all of this equipment um, and this preparation, it was really a huge, huge gamble. But we did it. We did it. And we captured amazing things. Tell us what your main take is on UFOs personally. What do you believe? I believe that it's it's a combination. The phenomenon is just not one thing. I think that's the biggest confusion. Uh, We want to kind of um, think that UFOs are extraterrestrial or it's the government hiding or something. I think it's both, and I think it's even more than that. I think some of them, the ones, the triangular ones especially, I believe uh, they are our own, military or otherwise. Um, And I think some other types of uh, UFOs are, to me, 100% UFOs. I mean, extraterrestrials. Extraterrestrials. Because, yeah, because the propulsion, speaking of propulsion system, the propulsion system they use also uh, they were we were able to measure the temperature on these UFOs, which again that's another thing, another added data that tells us it is an anomaly. So these objects were registering cold. So what kind of propulsion system do you know that will allow a craft to travel at very high speed and uh, have a cold temperature, meaning you know minus. 61 minus 52 it, it it just doesn't happen it's a propulsion system to me it's a technology that is extraterrestrial Tell me. and on, sorry go ahead on top of that i think part of the phenomenon is also atmospheric events i think there's a lot that we don't understand you know there are certain types of maybe plasma events or, you know, types of light and plasma combination, you know, um, we don't really know. Um, I mean, we know a lot, but (laughs) not enough, I think. And there could be some events that are simply atmospheric that we just don't understand. So that's why the UFO phenomenon is, is much bigger and more complex than we think. You mentioned earlier wormholes as a possible way of them traveling. Did you come across anything scientifically that could back that up? Well, yeah. I mean, that's uh, that's why I'm so excited about this film, because that was the main capture of the film. I don't want to spoil a surprise for those who haven't seen it. But uh, but still, even if, if I talk about it, you still have to see it, because it's never been captured on film before. And so what happened was on the last day, on one of the camera, we we see a sort of a cloud, some sort of a cloud-like thing that opens and closes, and uh, very quickly and reveals about fifty to a hundred small objects. I mean, on the camera they were small, but um, and so. We know, of course, now don't forget, I just want to remind the folks listening, that we're working with scientists, so very hardcore scientists. So these guys aren't going to look at something and say, oh, we captured a UFO. You know, the idea is to really try to debunk ourselves, you know, (laughs) say, well, wait, you know, maybe it's a camera glitch. Maybe it's a light effect. Maybe it's the reflection of the city somehow or something. Maybe it's a bug, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. Of course, that's the first thing we do, and nothing checks out. On top of this, we have a radar um, that picks up um, actual objects. Now, radar doesn't pick up on radiation, doesn't pick up on light. It picks up on objects, reflective objects. So these are actual reflective objects that appear, the, the, and then the cloud closes. It opens and closes, revealing these objects. So what is that? <laughs> what do you call that? And so it's captured on tape. I've never seen anything like it anywhere. And uh, sure enough, we also uh, cross-reference uh, with, for example, NASA, 
with, uh, you know, different organizations, earn, you know, all the different organizations that have data, for example, on some cosmic radiation event, even solar flares. We thought, well, maybe it's some sort of solar, you know, flare that had some sort of effect or something. Nothing is checking out that would explain this event. Were you surprised? Then, Were you surprised that you captured this? Very surprised. Very surprised. And to date, now the film has been out. Um, you know, we presented the data at C- uh, SCU, which is the Scientific Coalition um, of UFOs, UAPs. And, you know, there's many scientists who looked at it. So it's not like we're the only ones. Uh, we sent it to atmospheric, you know, scientists who, you know, in that field. Uh, we showed it to multiple experts in the field. We don't have anybody who can give us a really uh, logical explanation. So it's crazy. And on top of this, <laughs> since the movie's been out, we continue to uh, find to try to find even more data. So we started um, um, connecting with satellite agencies, you know, private and governmental Mm -hmm. satellite agencies to see if we could get satellite images of this thing. And so, of course, we send them the coordinates, the time, because we could, we were able to, the people will see it in the film. We know exactly where it's located. We know its size. We know its shape. We know, we know the whole, I mean, that whole data we have, it's in the film. And so we send that off to satellite agencies. Nobody can give us any images. Either they didn't have them or they didn't want to give give it to us. Or they're holding back. And then, yeah. uh, who knows? But then we file a FOIA request, Freedom of Information Act request, which comes back, uh, what? It's classified. Classified? So, classified. It's FOIA exempt. Exactly that particular time, that particular coordinate, uh, that particular date. Um, it, they, I mean, we have the letter, the rejection letter. Sorry, we can't give you that information. It is classified. What do you make of that? <laughs> well, they're hiding something. <laughs> so hiding. that's why. I mean, it's it's so if we can. Well, I mean, maybe you know, maybe it's classified because they are doing some sort of military thing. But what exactly at that time? Um, and there's nothing else. No, we didn't see any military planes or anything. And that wormhole-like uh, anomaly is not very high up. It's like uh, 1,800 feet up in the sky. So, you know, we we didn't see any other kind of military anything. So why aren't they giving us the data? Is it constantly changing, the wormhole? Or is it yeah. is it there that's stationary? A oh, that's a good question. Uh, I think some um, natural forming wormholes are always there, obviously, uh, because they're part of fa- the fabric of, of space, you know. And others that are m- not man-made that are like uh, created from uh, some sort of warping from a UFO or something uh, are there only when the craft is there. Uh, but what was fascinating is that um, people will see that in the movie. In the trailer, you have a glimpse of that. You you have 50 objects. We were able to, um, the scientist was able to actually measure the size of these objects. And each one was about 35 to 50 feet. And there are about 50 of them, like I said, like a fleet, um, which was interesting because if you recall, um, that was the size. These were that was the size of the Tic Tac, and several of the Navy folks mentioned a fleet of Tic Tacs, not just one, That's not right. just two, but a fleet. And we also heard about swarms of uh, those Tic Tacs. Uh, I think it was the USS Omaha at the time. So you know what's going on there? I believe that those particular wormholes may still be there in that region. That's my personal take um, and opinion, just because so many Navy ships have reported these types, I mean, not the wormholes, but these types of objects 
uh, swarming their ships and appearing in groups like that. So, I mean, that's that's pretty crazy. How do people see your film? Yeah, they can see it on you know, Amazon, iTunes, but, uh, you know, they can also watch it for free now. They can stream it for free on Crackle, Plex, Roku, uh, Tubi TV. Can they um, get to it through so, your website, atairinthesky.com? Yeah, yeah, I think the website is easier. Just go to com and just click on Watch the Movie, and they'll see all the platforms. Caroline, are you happy with the results of your film, The Tear in the Sky? Oh, yeah, 100%, because, you know, what people are going to see is not just the regular UFO things that you see pretty much everywhere on YouTube. We were able to capture very unusual things, you know, with uh, FLIR cameras. The FLIRs are about 10 times more sensitive than the night vision. It's, it's you know, industrial-grade FLIR cameras. And we saw some things that we've ne- we captured things we've never captured before, and so I think I really encourage people, uh, UFO folks or otherwise, to really check it out just to see those clips. You know, um, uh, all sorts of things literally falling down in the water, uh, multiple objects falling in the water, hitting the water, illuminating the water. I've never seen anything like it before. Um, in the UFO world. And of course, the wormhole anomaly, which is insane, (laughs) you know. So because of that, I'm very, very happy uh, with what we've captured um, on those devices and the correlations. In other words, it's not just one type of device. It's correlating with radiation, with other anomalies happening across devices. So because of that, I think we've done something that's never been done before. And um, and I'm very, very excited about it. Was your crew excited too? Yes, we, we were pretty blown away. And uh, like I said, even after the film, you know, we in five days, we collected thousands and thousands of hours of data the scientists are still going through it now, even three months, four months after the movie it has been out because uh, has been done because um, you know it, it's it's a it's a lot of work to really study frame by frame what's going on, and so I think uh, we were overwhelmed actually, and you know George, this tells us something. Imagine we are civilians. If anything, what this movie did is not only bring very unusual and new types of footage for everyone to see, but think about it. In five days, we are civilians, right? Of course, we had the proper equipment. We had a very large amount of equipment. But still, in five days, for us to capture that many UFOs on camera across multiple devices, uh, you know, that tells you, If we did that as civilians, you can't tell me that the government, with all their radars, all their sophisticated um, equipment and and, uh, infrared vision things, you know, devices, you know, those types of million-dollar devices, you can't tell me they don't have data. You know, it doesn't even make sense. So that's another reason why this film is so important, to validate the topic and to say, Stop telling us <laughs> stories. The data's out there. We just went out. We collected a whole bunch. Please check it out. You know what I mean? In 2018, you wrote a book called The Divine Plan, Now and Beyond 2250. How did you look out so far? That's 228 years away. Yeah, actually, I wrote this book in 2007, originally. And, uh, yeah, I mean, that's part of my work, like I said, since... Uh, I was a child, you know, tapping into the larger consciousness of of life. I started to see certain things about the future, the potential. You know, of course, um, it depends. There's different timelines because we create the future as we go along. But there are certain things that have been created from 200,000 years ago. In other words, you know, one generation after another creating a type of civilization creating sort of energy that has accumulated enough momentum that it is going to have a certain outcome. In other words, 
um, you know, if you already threw a ball, at, you know, if it's already in in flight, you can already predict where it's going to hit and when it's going to hit. But if you haven't uh, thrown the ball yet, then you have multiple probability and multiple potentials. So I talk about the events that have accumulated enough momentum that have already, they're already in flight, so to speak, that are the most likely to happen. And so I saw that it extended till for another 250 years from now. And so, and that's uh, in all aspects of our civilization. I'm talking about government, you know, not just the economy, but the whole structure, the systems that we live in, from education to agriculture to the environment, and also to the future human. How is the future human going to develop? So I had those visions and those uh, insights for, for a long time, and I thought I would share them um, in a book. Caroline, thank you for being on the program. A Tear in the Sky, the great documentary available off her website, a tearinthesky.com. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners, and new users will also receive a free two-week trial.